Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the GP practice webinar for managing GPs in PCSE online. My name is Debbie Roberts and I'm the engagement manager at PCSE and I will be facilitating this afternoon's session. So just having a quick look at today's agenda then. So I'm going to be starting off with user management in PCSE online. So I'll be discussing the user roles needed in PCSE online and how to create users and edit users in PCSE online. I'm then going to run through the performalist process. So I'm going to run through a GP journey right from the beginning. So when they need to submit an employment change and all the steps that are needed along the way right through to the estimates process. I'm then going to have a look at the actual performance approval side of things in PCSE Online. So I'll just show you what the screen should look like and how you do these approvals and if you need to reject any employment changes that come through. We're then going to have a look at the joiner and leaver pension forms in PCSE Online and discuss a couple of common errors that sometimes happen and just talk you through the process on how to complete those successfully. And then we'll end the session on practice estimate forms in PCSE Online. OK, so before we do make a start, I just wanted to let you know who we've got on the call today. So from the PCSE communications team, you've got myself and Kat. And then from user management and PCSE online, we have Marie. And from the performalist team, we have Julie, Lucy and Maria. And from the GP pensions team, we have Katrina. OK, so like I said, I'm going to start the presentation with user management in PCSE online. So it is really important to make sure that you have all the correct users set up properly at the practice. Now, in order to assign PCSE online roles, you first need to make sure that you've, got your, that you've got your user administrators set up correctly at the practice. Now, as a user administrator, their sole responsibility is to ensure that other people at the practice have got the roles assigned. Now, as a user administrator, that's, that is their sole job. Now, if you need to be able to assign yourself a role, then that's absolutely fine. You can do that as a user administrator, but it's also your responsibility to make sure that other people at the practice have got the roles needed to do, to do the various tasks in PCSE online. Now, at GP practices, there are three different user administrators. So for payments and pensions related jobs, we've got the GPP practice user administrator, Anything performalist related is the PL organisation user administrator. And then you've also got a main contact. Now, the main contact is more for supplies and medical records, which I'm not going to be discussing on this webinar. However, I will briefly touch on it just so you can understand the difference between each user administrator. Now, within a practice, you can have four of each user administrator, but that only applies to the payments and pensions user administrator and the performalist user administrator you can only have the one main contact. So four of each of the others and one main contact. <clears throat> I am going to go through this in a little bit more detail on the next slide, so um, just to explain what each user administrator can do. However, if you're not sure who your user administrator is at the practice, you can contact PCSE at the email address that's on screen. So it's pcse.portalenquiries at nhs.net if you do need to contact us to find out who your user administrators are. OK, so I just wanted to show you this slide just to give you a little bit of a visual on how the user management works in PCSE Online. So as you can see, each area has been split out separately. So you've got supplies and logistics, you've got the performalist services, and then you've got GP pensions and payments. Now, the user administrator for each area can only assign roles responsible or that link to that service. So the main contact user administrator will only be, assigned, be able to assign roles related to supplies and logistics. So that will be giving roles for people to order supplies or roles for people to manage the movement of medical records at the practice. So say, for example, if you've got somebody at the practice that needs the PL practice manager role, so they can go in and approve and review and check any employment changes that come through, the main contact will not be able to assign that role. It has to be the performalist organisation user administrator that does that. Hence why we've shown it on screen separately. So under each pink box, that's the roles that they can assign out. I know we did get some confusion from the last webinar that I held that people weren't able to assign certain roles and we think that this is the reason why. So if you're the GPP practice user management administrator, 
you can only assign roles that are related to pensions and payments, same as the perform list. So if you're the, if you're the PL organisation user administrator, you won't be able to assign anybody any pensions roles. So just have that in mind. If you are trying to give roles out to somebody or if you need a role yourself, you need to make sure that you're linking in with the correct user administrator. Now, say, for example, if you're the user administrator for payments and pensions, so you've got the GPP practice user management role, then if you need to assign a performance role, then you can also assign yourself to be a user administrator if you need to. And then once you've got that role, you'll then be able to assign the relevant roles for the performance role. I hope that's clear to understand. OK, so I'm just going to go through the roles just one more time just to try and keep them relevant to the webinar, because I do appreciate there's quite there was quite a few roles on that last slide that I just went through. So this is for performer list. So the PL organisation user administrator. Now that role is the only job that you can do with that is assign PL practice manager role. So if you need to assign anybody the role to review and accept any performance changes, you need to assign them the PL practice manager role. Now with that role, all they can do is review, approve and reject any performance changes. Looking at the pension side of things then, that's the user administrator for payments and pensions. And again, if you need anybody to have the joiners and leavers role, it will be the practice user management um, user admin role that will need to assign the joiners and leavers role. Now, with the joiners and leavers role, you'll be able to submit GP pension joiner and leaver forms. Without that role, you're not going to be able to do that. And the same with the practice estimates and salary change role. If you have that role, that will enable you to submit practice estimates and salary change forms. OK, so I'm now going to have a look at creating users in PCSE Online. Now, you will only be able to do this if you are the user administrator. So if you've just got a standard role, so if you're just the PL practice manager, you won't see this side of things in PCSE Online. This is just for the user managers, OK? So when you first need to create a new user, you'll need to sign into your PCSE Online account. And once you have logged into your account as a user administrator, you'll need to select the user management tab just at the top as that's shown in the blue banner highlighted in green and then head over to where it says create user. Once you click that, you will be prompted by a box that pops up basically asking if you're including a GP to PCSE online. Now, at this point, you can select no because you are going to be adding a member of staff to the practice. Now. Once, you, once you've selected no, it will just bring you to the create new user screen. Now, as you can see, everything will be blank in this area, apart from the area in grey where it says the requester's email. Now, that will be your email address in that box because you're the one that's creating the new account for somebody. Now, if you do need to create a new user, you'll just simply go in and enter all the details that you can. So it'll ask for the title, the first name, surname, telephone number, things like that. Now, it also asks for the email address. Once you put that email address in there, that will be that user's new username. OK, so just make sure that it's an email address that they've always got access to. OK, then what you'll need to do is assign roles. So you'll need to enter the organisation code just there at the bottom. And then once you do that, it will give a list of all the roles that are available to that user which will just pop up as shown on screen. Now, we just ask that you try not to assign every single role, just assign them the roles that they are going to need for the jobs that they're doing. Now, once you have found the role that you want to assign your user, so for this example, we are assigning the PL practice manager role. You simply just tick the box and then select create. And that will have then created your new user. Now, once you've done that, your new user will receive a verification email to verify their email address and then they'll be able to log in and create a secure password. However, just please be aware that the verification link that they receive will expire after 72 hours. Now, if they can't find the verification email, we just recommend that they check their junk or the spam folder within their emails. And if they do miss the verification window, then they can request a new link via that original email. OK, so it's not gone forever. They just need to request a new one. 
OK, so that was creating users in PCSE Online. Now, it may be that you need to edit a current user that's already got a PCSE Online account. <clears throat> so it may be if they've changed the details or you need to add some roles or you may have had somebody that's joining your practice that's worked at a previous practice and they've already been on PCSE Online and you just need to make sure that they're linked to your organisation and they've got all the correct permissions. So again, you just log into your PCSE Online account and select the user management at the top. Now, at this point, because they've already got an active PCSE Online account, you'll just need to enter the search criteria just so you can find that user in PCSE Online. Now, just for this example, I've just put test test. That's where you would put the name or the username. And then once you're happy with the details that you want to search for, you can click apply. And then what that will do is display your choose chosen user details. So as you can see here, it's picked up test test. That's their username. It will have the surname and the first name. It will also show you the details of when they last logged on and whether they've got any bad password counts. Then it will also let you know whether their account's been deactivated or not. Now, at this point, you'll want to edit your user. So as you can see on the right of the screen, it says edit user. You'll just simply tick that blue word in and that will then open up the page, which will show all the current details that we've got in PCSE Online for that user. Now, at this point, you can edit anything that's in blue. So if you need to change the name or the surname and any phone numbers, anything like that, this is where you'll need to do it. Now, if you scroll down further down the screen, you'll, this is where you'll see all the roles that they've currently got assigned to them. So say, for example, you've got a user that has too many roles. This is where you can then go in and remove them so they don't see any unnecessary work in their queues. Or if they need to start doing a job, so say like, for example, you want them to pick up joiners and leavers, you want them to be able to submit forms, you can then go in there and select the correct role that they need so they can then start seeing the work in their queue. This is also an area that you'll use where if you have deactivated a user. I am going to go into that in a little bit more detail further on down the slides, but just while I'm on this screen, I just wanted to show you. So if you have got a user that's been deactivated, say like they've let, they were on long term sick or something like that and you remove the access, this is the screen that you'll use when you need to reactivate your user. You'll just search for them, re-add the roles, click update and then it will reactivate that user in PCSE Online. Now, once you're happy with the roles and any edits that you've made, you'll just simply select update and that will update your user. Now, again, just please only assign roles that they do need. And um, we have had some organisations that have given out too many roles and it just makes it it's just unnecessary and it can cause a little bit of confusion for, to the user because they'll find a lot of work in their queues that they won't be able to action. So I'll just assign roles that they need. And just to let you know, sometimes there is a two hour window of new roles being activated in PCSE Online. So if you have a user that you've just given the joiners and leavers role to, but when they log in, they don't see the tile and they don't have the options to complete that work, it can take up to two hours for that to show through. So don't panic straight away. It can just take a little bit of time. Sometimes it could be 10 minutes, but like I say, it can just take a bit, a bit longer. So I just have that in mind before picking up the phone, wondering why nothing's come through to them. OK, so you also have the option to view all users that have accounts at your organisation. And it's really good practice, to be honest, just to go in and check this regularly, especially if you work at a big organisation where you may have high staff turnover at your practice. It basically just ensures that you've only got users at the practice with, with active accounts. And, you know, if anybody leaves and if, you've, if they've not deactivated them, you'll be able to catch this here and remove the access as soon as possible. So I'll just quickly show you how to view all your users then. So again, from the user management home screen, once you have logged into your PCSE online account, if you simply just move your mouse down to where it says my organisation only and select that box and then click apply, what that will do is bring up a list of all the users that you've got in PCSE online. It will also show all the accounts that are deactivated now, I know we did get some feedback and some comments from the last webinar that we did that we didn't want people to have that. But unfortunately, that's how the system's built. And 
if, for example, you do need to reactivate a user, this is where you can do it. So you do have an audit history of everyone that's been linked to the practice at some point. So within this, this area, if you see a user that is active and no longer works at your organisation, which you need to deactivate, I will show you that later on. But from this page, you also have the option to edit any users. So you can add roles and change any details, as I've previously mentioned. So if you do need to do that, you can just have a look and it will show the username. It shows the surname, first name, and again, all the details as it would do looking at to edit a simple user. Head over to edit user and then it will just show you all the steps what I've previously shown you. So it will pull up all the details that we've currently got and then it will give the option further down to add and remove roles where necessary. OK, so deactivating users in PCSE Online then. So we do recommend that you deactivate any users that have left your organisation or they no longer require access to PCSE Online as soon as possible. Now, any leavers who move to similar organisations will most likely use the same email address because they're using their NHS email address. And it is important that you remove their access to your organisation as soon as possible. Now, the main reason for that is, is because PCSE Online is accessible from any device that's connected to the internet. So, say for example, you've got a colleague that's left a practice, they're moving towns and they're going, to, they're going to be working at a different practice. If you don't deactivate them from your practice, when they log into PCSE Online at the new practice, chances are they're going to see all the details still in PCSE Online for your practice which they don't want. It's confidential information and they shouldn't have access to that anymore because they'll be working at a different practice. And I suppose the same goes if you've got somebody that's on long term sick or if they're going off on maternity, you don't really need them to have access while they're at home. So ideally what we recommend is deactivate that user until they're ready to come back to work. And like I mentioned before, you can do that through the update user. So you just edit your user, you'll pull up the details as I've shown you once you've searched for the name and then you can go in and add the roles back into their account and then that will reactivate their account for them. So I'll just quickly show you what the deactivate user slide looks like. So again, it's through the user management side of things. And then you will select the deactivate user, which is just in the grey header at the top that I've highlighted in green. And in this section, what you'll need to do is search for your user. So if you put the first name and last name in there and then select deactivate user, you'll get a pop up just whether you want to confirm. So you can click OK to continue with the deactivation or you can click cancel and then that will cancel your action. Now, if you do deactivate an account by mistake, don't worry, it's OK. Just as I mentioned about reactivating an account, you can just do it like that. So head over to search for user, put their details in, bring that up, and then you'll just be able to add the roles again, as you would do if you wanted to reactivate an account from someone that's been off for a while. OK, so that is all I wanted to run through with you for user management in, in PCSE Online. Now, I do appreciate I don't go into too much depth about it. However, we do have a wealth of information on the PCSE website. We've also got small user guide videos on the YouTube channel. We've got user guides and lots of information available on the PCSE website. So if you're not sure, please do have a look. OK, so I'm going to take a little break just to pause to see if there's any questions or if there's anything that Marie would want to run through with you with regards to user management. Due to there just being an audit of the users that are linked to your organisation. So we understand that if there is users, though, that shouldn't be linked to your practice, if you can just send us a screenshot of that to the portal inquiries email, we can have a look further for you. And also when you're linking users to your organisation that already have an existing PCSE online account, you just have to untick the box that says my organisation only. Once you untick that box, you'll then find that user and be able to link them to your organisation. Other than that, Debbie, that was everything. That's great. Thanks, Marie. So we're now going to be moving on to performer list employment changes in PCSE online. OK, so I wanted to start off by showing you this slide just to give you an idea of the GP journey when they do need to submit an employment change in PCSE Online. Now, all performance changes do need to start with the GP logging into PCSE Online and submitting that change request through to us. So 
the practice can't do this on behalf of a GP. I know we do get some practices wondering if they can because they can't get the GP to do it themselves. However, the GP does need to log in and action any request through PCSE online. Now, what happens is once the GP has logged in and submitted the change, so I'll say like, for example, if we have a salaried GP that's joining your practice, they'll log into PCSE online, they'll provide the practice details that, they're, that are needed, and then what will happen is PCSE will receive that request once it's been submitted. We'll just make sure that the GP's provided all the relevant details needed to progress the case. And then once we've done that, we will then send the request over to the practice. So this is when the PL practice manager role will see that you'll have an outstanding request that needs approval. We just ask that at this point you log into PCSE online and just double check all the details that the GP has submitted. So I think one of the main things to check would be the joining date, just to make sure that they are joining on that date. And then if you're happy with everything, you can just go in and approve that request. Like I say, I will show you details on how to approve, etc. later on in the presentation. Um, but this is just a brief overview at the moment. Now, for a salaried role, once the practice have approved that, that will come straight back to PCSE. And then what we can do is contact NHS BSA to get the prescriber number. And then at this point, you'll be able to go in and complete the GP pension joiner form in PCSE online. Once the joiner form has been completed, that's when the GP will then appear on the practice estimate form and then the pension deductions can be made from the practice and prescribing costs can be correctly aligned. Now, we appreciate it's not always as simple and as straightforward as that. There are a couple of things that can happen along the way, but I am going to run through that as well. I'm not just going to give you the happy path, OK? Now, a GP can also join as a principal GP, so I'll join as a GP partner. It will follow the same steps as a salaried. However, once it has been approved by you guys at the practice, we will also need commission approval. So as soon as you approve that in PCSE online, it will go over to the ICB for them to approve. Now, once the ICB have approved the request, it, again, it will follow the same steps as I've previously mentioned for a salaried GP. So we will contact NHS BSA, request for all the prescriber codes, you at the practice can then go in and complete the joiner. And then once you've done that, you can complete the estimate. Some of the problems that we do kind of see that happen is at the pension joiner side of things. So if a performance employment change has gone through and it's been approved by yourself and if required by the ICB, but you can't locate your GP on the joiner form, it may be that it's a newly qualified GP and PCSE don't have the SD number on file, so we don't have their pension scheme number. If that is a case and it is a newly qualified GP, then you can contact PCSE and let us know that number and then we will include that within our systems. Now, the reason why we don't have that detail of information already is because NHS pensions will have more than likely been sorting out the pension for the GP registrar. So it, nothing's ever actually come through PCSE. So we, once we have that number, we'll be able to put that onto the account. You'll be able to complete the joiner and do the next step as a practice estimate. Now, another query that we do sometimes get once the GP has been approved is that the GP isn't aware of how to find their prescriber number. Now, for a salaried case, we don't contact them with the number directly, like we would do with a principal GP, a GP partner. However, both salaried or principal GPs can log into the PCSE online account and they'll be able to find the prescriber code on there. I do have a screenshot of that to show you later on. It's not something that you'd be able to see at the practice, but if you do need to link in with any GPs at your practice to get the number, at least you're going to be able to see where they can find it if they log into their account. OK, so just looking at the performalist side of things then, before we do look at the pension joiner and estimates form in a bit more detail, now, at the moment, we do have quite a few GP employment changes that are outstanding at both practice level and ICB level. Now, this is for various reasons, which we do appreciate. However, we have been doing some recent webinars with ICBs and asking what kind of challenges they have with approving any employment changes. And one of the key themes were around the contract variation. So if a GP is joining as a principal or GP partner, then there is the contract variation that's needed in order to progress that case. Now, 
without that, the ICB cannot continue. Now, there is no set process set in place. Now, before PCSE transformed to PCSE online, PCSE agents would request this and they would start the ball rolling with the contract variation. However, that's no longer a PCSE process. Now, after speaking with some of the ICB members that are responsible for action in the performance changes, they were saying that it would be ideal for practices to link in with them as soon as they know they're going to have a partner either joining or leaving the practice, just so we can get that contract variation paperwork started as soon as possible. Now, one other thing that we did see is that we kind of see that a lot of ICBs work differently. There isn't really any set process set in stone. So I guess as from PCSE, we could just advise that it may be a good idea to link in with your ICB and see how to best work through these and just see if there's something that we can all do together to try and get these employment changes moving along for the GP. Essentially, we, we need the GP employment change approved as soon as possible. So essentially, when it comes to them doing the end of year forms, the pension is going to be accurate. And so as I mentioned previously about the prescriber number where the GP can find it. So like I said, you're not going to be able to view this from a practice point of view, logging in in your organisation. This is a GP's view. OK, just so just in case you ever need it, um, rather than picking up the phone to PCSE, you'll probably find that it's a lot quicker just to link in with the GPs whose prescriber number you require. Now, all they need to do is log into the PCSE online account and select the employment details tab as shown on the left. And then once they click that, it will show them lots of details, really. So it will show them their current employment details or so the practice that they're linked at. It will show the practice address, whether they are a principal GP or a salary GP. And it will also have the prescriber number there as well. So hopefully that will help you going forward if you are outstanding any prescriber numbers. Now, you can also check on the NHS digital ODS portal for a prescriber number if you're not having any luck with the GP. This isn't a PCSE website, but we thought we'd just show this for you just in case you do need to find a prescriber number. So once you visit the website, you can just put your practice code in the code search box, and then that should give you a list of all the GPs that are attached to your practice. And it will also include the prescriber number as well. Now, I do believe on this website when you do search for your GP, so sometimes there's a code in front of the prescriber number. So you'll need to take that off before using the prescriber code. So I just wanted to run through what kind of performance changes you're going to see in PCSE online. So if you've got a GP joining your practice, that will go through PCSE online. And if you've got a GP leaving your practice, again, that will run through PCSE online. They will also change the role. So if they are currently attached to your practice, but they need to change their role to a principal, that will need to be a full employment change as well. And again, if they're changing from a principal GP to their salaried GP, we won't know automatically that they've changed roles if they're currently attached to your practice. They do need to go into PCSE online and make that change. And again, if they're resigning or retiring, they'll put the withdrawal through PCSE Online as the same with 24 hour retirements as well. But again, if you want to be able to action any of these requests in PCSE Online, the role that you need is the PL Practice Manager role. OK, so I'm now going to show you how to approve and reject formalist requests in PCSE Online. So you'll first log into your PCSE Online account. As you can see on here, it's got two different tiles. So you've got a perform list tile and a records and supplies tile. Now you'll notice on this example, it doesn't have anything to do with payments and pensions. Now, these tiles will represent the roles that you've got in PCSE Online. So if you log into your PCSE Online account and you don't have the perform list employment change tab, that would indicate that you don't have the correct roles in PCSE Online. Just like if you need to go in and submit a joiner form or complete a leaver form, if you can't see the tab like you like the screen is now, chances are you don't have the role. That's why you can't see that on there. So you'll just need to speak to your user administrator and get them to add the required roles that you need. OK, so to start actioning any performance changes, you can either select perform list at the top or you can select perform list in the green tab there, just in the box. And then once on, once on this home screen, if you head over to the activities queue, 
this will bring up a list of all the cases that are awaiting action at the practice. Now, for this example, there is just one pending request. This may vary between practices. It all depends on how big you are and how many GPs you've got joining and leaving your practice or changing roles and things like that. However, for this example, you can just see the one on there. Now, it will show the case reference number. So if you do need to contact PCSE for any reason, that's the number that is assigned to that GP's case. That's the number that we'll use within our systems. And we have had a couple of instances where some practices, I think they're using smaller screens. So if when you do log into your activities queue and you feel like you've only got half of the information on there, just if you move the slider bar across, that's when you'll be able to see all the other options, okay. So once you have found the case that you want to have a look at or would like to review or approve, you'll just simply scroll up to the review practice change tab. And when you select that, it will pop up and open up the change that the GP has submitted. So it will have the practice name. It will have the role that the GP wants to join the practice. So for this example, as you can see, it says principal. So they're going to be a partner of the practice. They will input the start date, and that needs to be the date that they actually start in that role of the practice. And it will also include their name as well. It's just good practice when you are reviewing these changes, just to make sure that everything is correct, that the start date's correct and the role's correct. And if it is a principal, you know, make sure you get in touch with your ICBs just to make sure that the contract variation's ongoing, because you can go into PCSE online and click approve at this point. But the ICP won't be able to do anything with it until the contract variation has been completed. So the sooner you can start the ball rolling with that, the better, the better the chance the GP's journey will go a lot smoothly for them. So if you are happy with all the changes that the GP has submitted, you'll just simply select approve. However, if you're not happy, say, for example, with the start date that they've put, you don't agree that they're starting on that date, you can select reject. Now, once you select reject, you will be presented with a list of options as to re the reason why you are rejecting that case. So you've got things such as like the date doesn't match or the status doesn't match or the change is no longer going ahead. But you've also got another option as well. So if you click other, that will then open up a box and you can free type the reason as to why you're rejecting that change in PCSE online. And once you've done that, all you need to do is select your reason and then select reject and then that will go straight straight to the GP and then they can then resubmit their case in PCSE online. So you also have an option to search for GPs included at your practice. So once on the home screen, if you head over to where it says performer management, you will have the option to search for your GPs. So in that box, you can search for a single GP just by adding their GMC number and then select in search. And then that will display that GP. And then what you can do at this point is select that GP and then that will open up the audit history for that GP. At this point, um, if you can see a box under where it says action, it will say review change. However, for this example, this GP doesn't have any outstanding approvals. I will show you when um, I'm going through the historical cases report what it'll look like if there are any outstanding requests for your GP. But for this example, the GP doesn't have anything outstanding. But if you wanted to have a look in more depth at the GP and the audit history, you'll just select the performer name in blue because that's a clickable link and that will then bring up all the details that you can review. OK, so in the same area, you've also got the option to conduct an advanced performer search. So again, select the performer management tab. And then select advanced performer search. And then under performer type, you will need to change that to medical. And then if you select search at this point. When you click that, that will give you a list of all the GPs that are linked to your practice. Now, as I mentioned on the previous slide, as you can see under the action tab, which is just here on the right, it will show you here if there are any outstanding approvals or actions that need reviewing for the GP. So this GP here has got an action pending. So if you wanted to view that, you could simply just click that button 
and that will then open up any outstanding requests and you would just approve or reject as I've previously shown you. So anything in blue there down the side, that's also clickable, that will open up more details of the GP. OK, now, last but not least for a performer list, you can view the you've got an option to view the historical cases report. So if you just head over to the historical cases report tab. And then on this page, you've got the option to search between dates. So say like if you wanted to search for everything from within 2024, you could simply put the 1st of January 2024 and then put today's date and click search but like I say it's up to you what dates you put in there however just be mindful that anything that's been processed through PCSE online will be in here but anything pre-transformation so anything before PCSE online was introduced won't be included on these reports and that's simply because the data wasn't included once we, when the, the system was built so anything pre-transformation will be in here but anything beforehand won't be OK, so once you have put the dates that you want to search, pop your dates in, click search, and then that will give you a list. Now, you also have an option to download an extract of that, so it will be easy to filter through and things. So you just simply select download extract, and then that will give you a spreadsheet that will include things like the performer name, the performer type, it'll have the GMC number on there, and what kind of case type it was, whether they were a, a they were joining your practice which would be a gaining case if they were leaving that would be a leaver case and it's also got the dates on there as well of when the cases were completed and what kind of status it is along with the PCSE case reference number so if you ever needed to contact PCSE about a case always provide us a CAS number that's linked to them but yeah so that's it for performer list I'm going to have a quick break and just linking with Lucy to see if there are any common questions or if there's anything that she thinks I've missed or anything that you want to just run over with everybody. Thanks Debbie. Yeah hi everyone. I've got a few things that I just want to go over that I've seen some of them the most asked questions either today or in previous webinars. So just to reiterate what Debbie said about how important it is to keep the portal user roles updated at practice and um, without this the cases that we work on, they won't, they won't be able to make their way through the system. Equally, if you have any cases in your queues that you don't want to approve, but you're not sure what to do, please don't leave them in there. If the information is not right, please go ahead and reject them. And um, hopefully everything Debbie went over today will have helped with like how to do all the user roles updating, keeping those updated. Um, I've seen lots of questions on it as well. So I think we, we're getting through those too. If you've got any more trouble with it, though, just go ahead and email the portal inquiries address and we'll, we'll get it sorted. The system is meant to stop duplicate cases from happening. Um, however, if you think you've got duplicate cases in your queue and you're happy with the change, then you can just go ahead and accept one of them and reject the other one, stating duplicate case as the reason for rejection. And we'll, we'll get the accepted one through. A question I've seen pop up a couple of times today is do the GPs need to log the changes on their own portal? The short answer is yes, uh, that should be the first step for the GP to put an employment change request in on the portal. Once those approvals are back, um, you can then go in and sort out the pensions forms. If you're unable to submit a pension form, it might be because the GP hasn't yet updated the portal to change their employment. Please encourage all new and leaving GPs to log onto the portal and update their employment history every time they join or leave your practice. If they don't do it, it, it can end in costly implications for the practice as well as issues with prescribing. And um, if they have submitted the change, then the pension forms won't be able to be completed until we've got all the approvals in. So that would be practice approval for salaried or practice or ICB approval for partners. And um, something else I wanted to highlight was that the way that the NHS BSA are now issuing prescri prescribing codes, it's changed slightly. It means that they're asking us to swap them around uh, a little bit more than they used to. So every time we get a request from the BSA to swap a prescribing code around, 
we are emailing the practice managers just to let you know that we've changed it. So please keep an eye out for those emails too. On the historic cases, those really old ones where the cases were created in sort of 2019, 2020, we're so keen to get these out of the queues. So if you've got any questions about specific cases, go ahead and email us in. And that's everything really that I wanted to highlight. I'll, I'll hand it back to Debbie. No, that's great. Thanks for that, Lucy. OK, so we are now moving over to the pension side of things. And I just want to touch on non-GP partners in PCSE Online and what you need to do if you do have one that's at your practice and they are part of the pension scheme. So just a quick overview then. So non-GP partners do need the non-GP partner role in PCSE Online. And if you need to assign that role out, it's the user administrator for the GPP side of things. So it's a GPP practice user management role that will need to assign that out. If the role hasn't been assigned to your non-GP partner, the name will not be found on the pension joiner or leaver form. So if they don't have a PCSE online account, you'll need to go in and create them a new one. If they do have a PCSE online account, then you'll just need to go in and edit the user as I've previously shown you. Now, if, you jo if your non-GP partner can't be located on the pension joiner form once you've done everything that you think that you should have done, this would indicate that we, they haven't had their pension deducted via PCSE. Now, in this instance, it's very similar to the GP registrar side of things. You just need to let PCSE know their pension scheme number, i.e. the SD number, and then we can get that included into PCSE online. Once we have that, you'll then be able to find them on the joiner form once we've added it to the system. So here are just a couple of things that a non-GP partner will be able to do once they have the role assigned in PCSE Online. So they'll be able to view their employee contribution statement once pension deductions have been commenced. They'll be able to complete and submit an annual certificate, view previous annual certificates submitted, view AVC applications, and they'll be able to opt out or back into the pension scheme. OK, so pension joiner forms in PCSE Online then. So basically the joiner process will happen once all the employment change details have been done. So I just wanted to bring you back to this screen, this screen just to show you where we would be in this part of the process. So where it says waiting for details, that would be the practice approval. That's all been done. And then you can log in to your PCSE Online account and you should be able to complete the joiner form. Now, the pension joining form must be submitted through PCSE Online to start pension contributions when a GP or non-GP partner joins your practice. Your GP will need to be aligned to your practice in order to complete the joiner form. And as I've just mentioned, all the employment details and side of things needs to be done as well. However, just please be aware, this is a separate step for you to complete the practice once it's all been approved by all the parties, so i.e. the practice and the ICB required. And again, if you're struggling to locate your GP or non-GP partner on the joiner form, chances are PTSE don't have the pension scheme number. So please do just give us a call and we will get that added on for you. So to locate the pension joiner form then, you'll need to log into your PTSE online account and then click on the GP pensions and payments tab and then just go through the steps. So it's click pensions, click on the pension joiner and then select the joiner entry form. So I'm just going to show you a quick video now of completing the joiner form. It's got a couple of hints and tips on there for you as well. Completing the pension joiner form in PCSE Online is easy. Once you're on the form, simply select your joiner type. So whether you're completing the form on behalf of a GP or a non-GP partner, then simply search for your selected GP or non-GP partner. For a GP, we recommend using the GMC number to search, and for a non-GP partner, an SD number can be searchable. You can also search for their name as well if you wish. Once you have found your GP and selected their name, the details in the grey boxes will auto-populate with their details. The practice joiner form can be completed with a joining date in the current or previous financial year. However, please be aware that the joining date must match your GP start date at the practice. If you have a GP that joins the practice but isn't part of the NHS pension scheme, then the practice do not need to complete this joiner form. However, 
If you have a GP that decides to join the pension scheme midway through their time at the practice, that's when you will need to complete the joiner form and the start date that you'll need is the date that they opted in to the pension scheme and not the actual start date at the practice. You'll then need to select the income type, whether it's a partner type one or salary GP type two, and then select the box to match the financial year the GP joins your practice and using the drop down arrow, select your GP's tier rate. Further information about tier rates can be found on the NHS Pensions website. Once you have selected the correct tier rate for your GP, you can then enter your GP's estimated NHS pensionable income for your practice. If your GP has an estimated solo income, freelance GP locum income, or income pension at other surgeries, you can also enter that detail here. However, if they don't, you can simply enter the figure as shown on screen. Once you are happy with the details you have entered for your GP, you will notice that the date will have auto populated. You can then tick to confirm that you're happy with the details and then select submit. You also have the option to save the letter or print if you wish. This will then automatically calculate the monthly payments and start pension contributions for that GP or GP partner. If you don't see the joiner appear on your form, just make sure that the GP has done all the employment side of things and it's all been approved. If you've got a newly qualified GP or a non-GP partner that are new to the pension scheme, just check that PCSE do have the pension scheme number. They're the main reasons that we usually see if a practice can't find the GP on the form. If you want to find the form, log into your PCSE online account and then just follow up through the steps, clicking GP payments pensions and then onto practice joiner and then select the joiner form. If you need to view the joiner listing screen, so this form will be able to show you all the forms that have previously been completed for a pension joiner. Again, just follow all the steps, but as you see on that same page, you'll see where it says joiner listing, then you can select that. Now, just please be aware that if you're viewing a form in the joiner listing screen, these forms can't be edited. If you do need to make a change for the current pension year, then we do have a salary change form or you can go to the estimate screen and submit a revised estimate. Now, if you have made a, a mistake in a historic joiner, you'll need to submit an online inquiry by the contact us form to let us know the correct information. OK, so moving on to pension leave forms in PCSE online then. So if you do need to complete the pension leave form, then you can do so as soon as you know that your GP is going to be leaving the practice. And once you do that, it will stop the payments from your next contractual payment. So as soon as you have that date that your GP is going to be leaving, please do complete the leave form and let us know as soon as possible. So it stops all the contributions being taken from your practice. If you need to view the leave form, again, log into your PCSE online and follow all the steps going through payments and pensions and then just select the lever entry form. So I'll just quickly show you the lever entry form then. So as I mentioned, it can be completed with a leaving date in the current or previous financial year. And once you're ready and have entered all the details, so you'll just put the GP name and the leaving date and then click the submit button. The pension contributions will be adjusted in the practice's next contractual payment. Now you can submit the leave of form as soon as you are aware the GP is leaving your practice to stop the pension contributions for that GP. And again, if you do need to view any previously completed pension leave of forms in PCSE Online, then you can do that via the listing screen. So I'll just quickly show you what the listing screen looks like. So just to show you, you can simply add your required search details so you can search for the GP name or the GMC number and add all the relevant details that you may need. OK, so and estimate forms in PCSE online. Now, estimate forms will be the end of the performer journey. So once the GP has gone through and they've done all the employment change details, and they've done the pension joiner, they'll then be able to, they'll be appearing on the practice estimate form. Now, if you find that the GP isn't appearing on the practice estimate form, 
chances are the join has not been done. If the join can't be done, chances are the employment change hasn't been done. Having a copy of this just to show you all the steps that you need. If you find that the GP isn't on the estimate form, chances are one of the previous steps hasn't been completed. So just a quick overview then. So the annual practice estimate of pensionable profit should be submitted via PCSE online. And it is important that the estimate is as accurate as possible to avoid large adjustments when end of year certificates are reconciled. Now, the PCSE online estimate form does pre-populate with the details of the active pension scheme member, meaning all you need to do is go in and pop all the estimated pensionable pay and the tier rate in there. However, I have got a quick video to show you, which Katrina kindly went through on a previous webinar. Now, just a reminder that if you do want anybody at the practice to be able to submit and complete the estimate form, that's the role that they need. They need the GPP practice estimates and salary change role. Logged into GP pensions and I'm just going to click the estimate button. So practice estimates. What you will see now is that you have the option to select the 24, 25 year. And what you will see, and you know, some people have pointed out that there are some GPs that they would like to or expecting to see on their estimate who are not there and we come back around that again just to make sure it's clear enough what we need to do if that does happen but for your GPs you just like the NHS pensions form itself then we you have the different sections so you have um, GP partners you have salary GPs and then you have non-GP partners if you have any in your practice so form will populate with the GP details. So if we start with our, our first GP, then what we're looking at in terms of the key elements that you need to complete and the only columns that you need to really be concerned about will be a column that says estimated surgery pensionable income, and then it will be the tier rate income. So there is a, another column that you can add any other pensionable income into there but as a practice manager then it's not particularly expected that you would have you would be privy to that information so the important thing is that the tier rate that the GP feels is applicable to them for that year is the tier rate that you select and the estimated income that is going to be earned at your practice. So let's just say doctor number one be going to say 50,000 and I should have had the tier rate table at hand to check the correct brackets but he may or GP might have you know a lot of other roles and they know that they need to be paying a tier or on the highest tier. Now what you will notice when you go to the 24-25 estimate form is that the tier rates have changed again or at least they have changed effect from the 1st of April 24. That was a, as a result of another consultation by Department of Health and Social Care. So you'll find the tier rate table in the NHS pensions website. So your tier rate, then you select the appropriate option. So there's a reduced number of options now. So let's just say our GP is on 12.5. Doctor number two, then again, it's just what's the estimated annual income for this doctor? What's the tier rate? That we expect for them and so on and so forth. So all you are doing is working your way down the form, populating with the estimated income for the practice and the tier rate. You work your way down all of those and then we will go to the submit button. So let's just put some more figures in to here. And the form itself, as you've seen there, it only gives you the option of the tier rates that will exist for 24-25. So there isn't any uh, way that you can put in a tier rate that wouldn't be, that the system wouldn't be able to accept. Clearly, you know, it just takes some time and care when you're putting the, the numbers in. I, I do recall one person last year calling up in a, a complete panic because they submitted theirs and I think instead of 25,000 they might have put something like 250,000 or it might even have been another zero onto that but we were 
very quickly able to to terminate that submission and they started again. OK, and then we've got our non GP partner at the bottom. So. Again, let's just select whatever tier rate we've got there. So that gives you a total of the estimated pensionable pay for the practice. Now, again, I'm sure that you all know, but what then happens when we've clicked submit on this, the system will automatically calculate and divide the annual pensionable pay by 12, and then it will apply the tier rate that you've selected on a monthly basis to that 1 12th of the income, and that will determine the employee contributions that are taken for your practice for each of the GPs. So divide their pension will pay by 12 and then it will apply the tier rate that you've selected for that GP. It will also apply the 14.38% to that 1 12th income for the monthly employer contributions. And you'll see when you get your monthly practice statement, you'll see all of your individual GPs listed out. You'll be familiar with that, where you have a section for employee contributions and you have a section for employer contributions. So in terms of actually creating and submitting the estimate form on PCSE online, then it is just as simple as that. So all we need to do is tick to confirm and then click submit. We get another chance to confirm that we are happy with the submission. And that's it. OK, so hopefully that's helped with the demonstration that Katrina has recorded for us for, uh, during a previous webinar. So you may also need to inform us of a change of salary if your GP is changing salary, so you'll be able to use the GP salary change form. Now, if you have a GP who has a change of salary midway through the year, you can complete this change of salary form. Now, this is for a salaried GP. So if a principal GP is a change, has a change of estimated income, it's good practice to submit a revised estimate form instead. Now, this will ensure that the correct pension contributions are being made and reduce the risk of any large adjustments when your GP has submitted the end of year forms. OK, so again, you'll be able to find that form in PCSE online and just following through the, the payments processes and then clicking the salary change form. OK, so before we do make a close, I just want to link in with Katrina. If there's anything that you think I may have skipped past, any important information that I might have missed or that you want to clarify or any questions that you wanted to highlight? I think there's quite a lot, Debbie, in the chat <laughs> about pensions, as we would expect. It's probably a little bit ambitious to try and cover end to end. Really a great idea to try and cover end to end for for practice managers, but it, it probably is is a little bit over ambitious in an hour. So let's have a look at maybe a, a follow up session where we we go around the um the key points that people have have raised. It is all the common things that we've picked up on before, you know, in the guides that we've produced previously, either for the PL team, pensions team, etc. So let's see what we can do to make them more more accessible and usable, and run some more sessions. But uh, yeah, thanks very much. Yep, no, sounds good. Thanks, Katrina. OK, so we are going to make a close. Just like to say thank you for attending. But other than that, thank you to all PCSE colleagues as well for supporting with the chat in the background.